Good evening. I'd like to call the City of Mount Vernon City Council meeting for January 11, 2023 to order. The time is now 7.02. Would you please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Council members Holst and uh, Hudson are excused tonight. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll, though. Council member Beaton? Here. Council member Brocksmith? Here. Council member Kreas? Here. Council member Molinar? Here. Council member Morales? Here. Thank you. Uh, moving on to community comments. Item one is a review of emails from the public. The public comments may be sent to community comments at mountvernonwa.gov. I'll ask staff if there were any received comments. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. Yes, you had one email. Uh, while well, you were out and this email is from Elizabeth Asher and Elizabeth writes good afternoon I am not sure if this is the best forum for my inquiries but if not I'm hoping you can point me in the right direction I've lived in Mount Vernon for almost nine years now and would love to help it continue to grow into a vibrant welcoming place we can all be proud of my first question is do we have a community garden and if not who would you recommend I get in touch with to begin to set one up I live adjacent to WSU and have an unused acre that perhaps could be put to good use. Or if there is a piece of vacant land that could use some love, that would be great as well. My second question is a much bigger one. What steps is Mount Vernon taking to help our unhoused population? I will say I would love to see something ideal <coughs> like, a, like the vacant land near the I-5 ramp being used for housing that also consisted of counseling, rehab, job, coaching like a cafe or something where they could gain meaningful and useful skills. It seems as though our population is a large one and we would all love to see them receive the care and support they need to be able to care for themselves in more meaningful ways. What ways can we make something like this happen as community members? What steps can we take and who can we connect with? Thank you so much for your time, Elizabeth Asher. <coughs> that is all of the written comments. All right, thank you. Um, staff from my office will respond with some information, but then the council, of course, is free to respond if you'd like. But we'll definitely send uh, Elizabeth links to a lot of the work, not o including the Integrated Outreach Services Program, uh, Martha's Place, and then joint uh, initiatives with Skagit County. So, um, All right, item two is public comments for anyone that happens to be here. If, if anyone would like to come and speak, you're welcome to step to the podium at this time. Anyone for public comments? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and move along. Our consent agenda tonight is consists of items A, B, C, D, and E. These are council meeting minutes, payroll checks, claims, direct deposits, and yep, that's it. Could I call to move the notes off the consent agenda? Which ones are, which notes? The meeting notes. The meeting minutes for December 14? Yes. All right. And otherwise would move to approve the consent agenda? All right. Second. All right, motion uh, by Richard and a second by Melissa. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, why don't we go ahead and consider? Notes? Yeah, on the just, meeting. Just missed a word is all. And I, and I didn't think I could mention it in the consent agenda. And so I can just call out. <clears throat> it's the section E, approval of agreement for Skagit Watershed Council. And it says council member blank disclosed his interest it should say council member brocksmith that's it <laughs> i'll ask the clerk to make sure we got that note excellent all right otherwise i'd make a motion to approve the notes as amended all right thank you second all right uh, motion by richard and a second by juan all those in favor please signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed saying <coughs> aye. motion carries thank you all right, under reports tonight, we have our committee report from Public Works and Library Committee, and that's Councilmember Gary Molinar. Gary. Okay, we opened up the uh, Public Works Library Committee tonight at 6 o'clock um, after the approval of the December 14th uh, minutes. Uh, Blaine Chesterfield, our program our coordinator, uh, gave us some updates on uh, the flood protection uh, progress that uh, some of the issues that we had with the flood wall uh, during the uh, last the year before his flood. And uh, we've gotten some of those things uh, fixed. Uh, the sheep pile uh, flood wall welding was done over uh, recently. And um, we also had uh, the Hogue Road backflow check valve 
uh, was replaced and items in progress include uh, completion of the flood wall between freeway drive and i-5 across the, the railroad tracks and the seneca road uh, culvert cleaning that uh, had a lot of silt that filled that up um, fema has already reimbursed the city for the uh, hogue road check valve and the city has submitted for reimbursement of the sheet pile uh, wall wel uh, welding um, the city d uh, discussed uh, eight culverts which are being considered for state and federal this uh, passage funding opportunities for design and construction um, next Bill Belick uh, gave us some other project updates the Hogue uh, and LaVenture intersection uh, improvements design is complete and will be advertised for construction uh, bid later this month uh, public works are requesting the city purchase a signal cabinet and control system of the state off the state contract ahead of construction later this month uh, we're hoping to start in april or may uh, both the paving program and curb uh, ramp uh, program for 2023 will uh, be advertised for bid within the next two weeks uh, to be constructed uh, this spring and summer uh, there's also a little issue down on second and gate street uh, design uh, to adjust the bulb out at the corner on the northeast corner um, is to uh, be completed and will be advertised for bid uh, the first part of February and be uh, constructed this uh, spring. The annual sewer and storm lining uh, program for 2023 will likely be uh, adverted for bid, advertised for bid in March or, uh, or April of this year. Um, Public Works is uh, preparing to solicit services for engineering <coughs> firm to design <coughs> replacement culverts at the 18th Street crossing and 19th Street crossing of Colsh Creek, uh, Colshan Creek in the February-March time frame. Um, the city will also be pursuing a feasibility and initial design to uh, separate the stormwater system uh, from the sewer system. The goal of this project is to uh, sign significantly increase capacity in the wastewater uh, treatment plant by reducing excess uh, storm flow uh, water. Uh, Public Works will be bringing a contract amendment, a proposal to Council for Construction Management of the Hogue LaVenture intersection project with the ta uh, Transpo Group. Uh, Public Works will also bring several, several new on call service contract proposals for Council approval. In the future, uh, some of the things that we need help with our electrical landscaping uh, general construction surveying uh, and materials testing services then we had um, after that was completed uh, Isaac Huffman our uh, library librarian I did some overview on the new library efforts to raise money uh, for the library commons project as well as review the, the project status challenges and wins that were occurred over the last month uh, We've raised uh, another 40,000 uh, in December and 20,000 so far in January. Um, he also spoke about the Christmas programming, uh, upcoming events uh, such as uh, and, and the salsa night that occurred at Hillcrest Park. Um, and then um, Chase Kenny uh, gave us a little update on uh, some of the funding for the Library Commons project and on the good of the order Aaron Cater uh, talked about the salary differential for police uh, lieutenants and sergeants and how that could be uh, rectified and will be coming forth in the next few meetings uh, and we close the meeting at 655 all right thank you Gary <clears throat> item B tonight is our council member comments any council member comments tonight all right oh go ahead please council member Juan Morales thank you uh, well first I just want to begin um, by saying Happy New Year's uh, to all the families in Mount Vernon, uh, to staff and your loved ones, uh, to my colleagues and your loved ones. Uh, hope everybody's starting off with, uh, you know, in a good year with much health and, and peace in your homes. Um, now, as we close 2022, um, we were confronted with a winter storm. Uh, during that time period, I heard some, some feedback uh, from the community as to the conditions uh, in the city with the streets. Um, and I know Mother Nature is a force to reckon with. Um, on the agenda tonight, I believe we'll have an update on that winter storm uh, to see what went well and also potentially in the areas that may have not gone as well. And um, if areas of growth are identified, uh, I do look forward to hearing uh, proposed solutions um, on that topic. 
Uh, lastly, I do want to um, uh, tip my hat off to the officers of public safety, specifically those to the fire department um, and the police department. Last week, I witnessed a building catch on fire uh, prior to first responders arriving. Uh, with other Good Samaritans in the area, we were able to provide some aid prior to their arrival. And just witnessing the courage that was displayed uh, by the firefighters, by the police officers there that were present, uh, is a type of courage that's, that is unmatched. Um, and I simply commend their bravery uh, when running towards danger. So thank you to those departments and your members. All right, thank you. Any other council member comment? All right. Um, under mayor's, <clears throat> mayor's report tonight, um, just wanted to take a few minutes to honor Mayor Sky Reichendeifer uh, and recognize um, his passing and also the service and the legacy to our city. Um, Mayor Sky uh, passed away recently. Some of the notes from his obituary describe him as an intelligent, gregarious, kind, tech savvy. Uh, mayor Sky nurtured an interest in politics. He was elected mayor of Mount Vernon, a post in which he served from uh, 1996 to 2003, he served two terms. Uh, Sky was proud of many of his achievements while in office. These are things that have benefited our, benefited our community from his time in office and moving forward. That's the establishment of the citywide fiber optic network before everyone, anyone knew what fiber was, so it was pretty forward thinking. Uh, development and construction of the Skagit Station, it's our multimodal transportation station. Under his leadership, the Mount Vernon was designated as the best small city in America, and also donation um, to the city of the Celtic Stage at Edgewater Park, and many others. Part of his work in benefit to the cultural life of Skagit County was recognized in 2007, when Mayor Sky received the Governor's Heritage Award for his work in support of the restoration of the Lincoln Theater, fundraising and advocacy for um, McIntyre Hall, the tremendous addition and tourism engendered by the great success of the Skagit Valley Highland Games and Scottish Fair, and again, just in general, the cultural life of Skagit County was enriched so much by his leadership and time here. Um, this uh, last, in 20, uh, 2022, he attended City Council uh, just a few months ago, really, to celebrate the enormous success of the return of the Highland Games after the pandemic. I think he was so excited about the success of that, um, that event and bringing it back. He presented a check to the city to help um, further um, take improvements forward at Edgewater Park uh, to do electrical improvements. And so um, just a, a minute to recognize his contribution and legacy, uh, remembering his family. Um, a few of us in this room, like maybe three or four of us, four of us uh, worked for him. And so just wanted to take a minute to um, be thankful for his time serving our community. Um, in addition, uh, Council Member Erin Moberg also recently passed away. Um, <clears throat> she was appointed to her position by the fellow council members here on the dais tonight in January of 2019. She was then officially elected by Mount Vernon residents in November of 2019. Uh, she unfortunately had to resign her position on October, in October of 2020 due to an illness. She served a, the community as a registered nurse for a local medical group and a maternity support services provider for Skagit County. She also served as a volunteer coach for Girls on the Run at Centennial Elementary School and was a Skagit Transit board member while she was a council member. She also volunteered uh, at her children's school, the Summerson Mon Montessori School. She passed away Sunday, December 18, in the arms of her mom and her family. We wanted just to take a minute to honor her service and let her family know that we're thinking of them and we're grateful for the time that she con contributed to the city of Mount Vernon. Uh, turning to uh, a, a brighter future focused topic, um, this is the Mount Vernon Library Commons construction update. So those of you who that have been downtown recently have seen some of the disruption and I hope you consider it exciting and not inconvenient. It will be temporary and we will be benefiting uh, greatly uh, from the project. The primary wow. focus right now has been the removal, relocation and installation of existing utilities. Puget Sound energy work should be completed by the end of next month. 
Uh, there is aggregate peers that are being, um, there are geo peers that are being installed, almost a thousand of them. And we've got about 750 of those done. So still a little bit more work there. We have discovered some storage tanks. We figured there'd be at least one, but now we're up to number three. And when you're doing uh, aggregate piers every four feet, you're gonna find every possible thing you're gonna find in that soil. So uh, we've been successful at quickly being able to mitigate those issues and move along. Um, also, a tower crane foundation has been poured and the tower crane will be erected in, uh, I believe January 25th and 26th if we stay on that schedule. So that'll be kind of exciting to see downtown. And hopefully we'll be out of the ground, starting to pour foundations. People can see the building starting to rise, probably in the February timeframe, but just exciting things that are happening. You can follow the construction progress on our website, mountvernonwa.gov, including a live camp. You can see uh, videos on construction updates and also subscribe for those construction updates um, on our website. Uh, that's what I've got for Mayor's Report. So item D is our committee agenda requests. Um, if, I'll ask if council has any, but before that, I just want to update. Council member Beaton asked for a, a, a public restrooms in pocket parks, and that will be scheduled for January 25th at our committee time. Our, public, our Parks and Enrichment Services Director will have information on that in committee. Just wanted to, to note that. Is there any other uh, committee agenda requests tonight? <coughs> I had asked um, previously <coughs> about pedestrian uh, walkways on Division Street Bridge or a, a independent bridge. I know we were patient, you know, kind of thinking, waiting to see some other things happen, but I can keep that on the list. Sure, I will make sure it's on here. Okay, Thank you. Okay, any other agenda requests? Okay. So I'm gonna write it down before I forget. <laughs> All right. Um, there is no unfinished business tonight. First up under new business is item A. It's a presentation, um, an update from the Friendship House. So tonight we're gonna welcome our exec uh, executive director, Jonathan Klein, and I'll ask Peter Donovan if there's any other uh, introduction you want to make for this Thanks, item. Thanks, Mary. Just an introduction uh, for Mr. Klein. Uh, the city has long supported the, the Friendship House uh, in their efforts to provide two clean and sober emergency shelters, uh, one transitional home, one permanent low-income shared living house, a daily meal service, uh, and an innovative employment training program. And Council has approved support for Friendship House in a number of ways over the years, including through the, the City Council budget, through HUD CDBG funding, and more recently uh, through the City's Affordable Housing Sales Tax, uh, or 1406 grants. Uh, recently, Friendship House hired Jonathan Klein as the organization's newest executive director, and as Mayor Boudreau said, um, Mr. Klein is here with us tonight by Council request to update Council on the Skagit First Steps program and, and also some of the other programs that Friendship House uh, has. Going on, but Mr. Klein, I'll invite you up here. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is uh, Jonathan Klein. Uh, I'm new in this role probably about five months now. Uh, but before that, I uh, ran the Whidbey Homeless Coalition over in Island County for several years. So, um, some similarities, but also a lot of differences in homelessness between Island County and Skagit County. But it's been uh, been great to come on board, and I'm uh, thrilled to be able to come and, and chat with you guys a little bit tonight. Um, share a little bit about what we've done for some of you. It may be review, but maybe there's a couple things that we've added in recent years that folks may not be be aware of. Um, our mission's always remained the same, and that's uh, to reflect the heart of God by feeding, sheltering, clothing, and healing, and to empower those in need. Um, we look at doing that mostly through providing uh, housing for folks as we're majority of our work centers around shelter, but also in working with connecting folks to services, um, both mental health and or uh, health services, as well as providing those uh, daily meal services. The, the first project that I want to talk a little bit about is our First Step Center, which is over in Burlington. Um, it's a newish program for us. We're about a year and six months in. so. Uh, We've been, been learning a lot about what we thought it was gonna look like in year one and then <laughs> what it looks like now a year and a half in and kind of uh, adjusting to what we think it'll look like going forward. Um, but that program is uh, 45 tiny homes that we have over in Burlington. Um, we do 
Uh, 42 of those are open to the public through coordinated entry, and then we reserve three of those as police drop-off uh, areas if, if the police need to bring somebody by um, that's uh, cold or in some kind of a situation where they need service. We always uh, keep three of those units available. <coughs> um, that shelter is set up more as a low barrier shelter, and that's something that's, that's new for us. Um, most of our programming here in Mount Vernon is all sober living housing. Um, but in looking at a, a demographic that was kind of being excluded from that housing and wanting to provide housing in a place where people can be warm and cold, this program operates as a, as a low barrier shelter. Um, in recognizing all the complex uh, issues that come with a low barrier shelter, we do have 24 hour staff over there, 24 hour security over there, um, and staff have all gone through mental health first aid trainings and different things like that to deescalate situations that potentially do, do come up there. Um, in addition to providing the access to the tiny homes that they have, um, where they do have um, their own bed, their own heater, things like that, um, we also provide access to everyone with uh, showers and then a free laundry service so that folks can maintain their, their hygiene and make sure that they have a nice, good, clean pair of clothes to put on at the end of the day, as well as uh, provide rooms for uh, service providers to come in to meet with folks that may be trying to network with them about issues that they have with health or uh, housing or things like that. So providing that space where they can meet kind of with their caseworkers is, is key to what we do over there as well. Um, we have about 21 people over there that keep that running um, from uh, people that are just doing the, the upkeep and maintenance all the way to the actual uh, caseworkers. Um, something that we are doing uh, this year that's uh, in partnership with this, but kind of in addition to this, is partnering that with a cold weather shelter, uh, which frees up in this area where you see the, the chairs that's now uh, turned into a congregate cold weather winter shelter, which frees up an additional 25 folks a night that we can house in there. Um, we are partnering that with a, a day center this year that we've started uh, working in partnership here in Mount Vernon with the Methodist Church and with uh, Welcome Home Skagit that provides a day warming center. Um, so it's the first year that we've done that and it's been going really good. We see on average about uh, 30 people a day coming through the warming center. Some are there for all day. Some others are just coming in to get a, a, a bite to eat and a, a cup of tea or something to warm up. But we're about 30 folks a day there um, and then we've been averaging about 20 to 25 of those folks continuing to come in to, to shelter in the evening um, so that's been uh, been a, a new a new process for us and then both our, our pickup and our drop-off for that cold weather winter shelter happens right there at the Methodist Church in Mount Vernon so we do all of our registration off-site so that if there's going to be an, an issue with somebody um, usually that issue presents itself before they make their way all the way over to the shelter and we can we can make other arrangements for them at that time um, in addition to the cold weather shelter, we do run a men's and a women's sober living house here in Mount Vernon, um, just a, a couple blocks away from downtown. Um, both of those programs are set up as sober living housing. Um, in 2022, we saw about 75 uh, people come through the women's house. The women's house is typically uh, women and children over there. That number's uh, down a little bit for us this year, but mostly because um, we're doing some uh, fairly serious renovations to the area of the house where typically we had a lot of family housing. So we only saw 10 kids come through the program uh, this year just because of a limit of space. But um, we are real excited in the next week or so, we're gonna be able to start opening that up and letting folks back into that area as well. <laughs> Um, the men's house has been about 76 folks that come through, and one of the other things that we do at the men's house is we do provide um, one to three day kind of transient stays. Um, men's shelters are extremely rare. Um, we run the only men's shelter or men's specific shelter in at least the surrounding three counties. Um, it's something that I tried to push for in Island County, and I, I failed miserably um, <laughs> to get that established, but I'm very proud of the one that we have here. Um, most of the men that come through there uh, are staying with us at about 60 days, um, but then the, the transient, we had about 100 folks come through in transient that just were, uh, didn't have access to get someplace. Either they got stuck here for a day or two until they could get a bus out, or it was uh, coming in after hours and needing to connect with another service provider that next day. So we allow them to kind of stay in a, in a central area of the house for a day or two until we can figure out what's next for them. So we were able to help uh, 
about uh, 99 people uh, in that way uh, this last year. Um, so we're able to house in those houses about 24 folks is our max in the women's house and uh, 20 is our max in the men's house. Um, luckily, we're not always at, at full capacity. That, that can get pretty, pretty busy, but uh, there's definitely times when, when that does happen. Um, and uh, one of the things that the city of Mount Vernon has uh, really helped us with and is helping us with right now is uh, in some of the renovations around our transitional house and uh, in the, the men's and women's house around trying to just bring our buildings uh, up to a little little nicer standard and, and update some a little bit more energy efficient windows and whatnot. Now we also run Barbara's House, which is a, a subsidized senior living. Um, it's a permanent housing program, but for, for seniors, low income seniors. Um, we have five folks that, that live in that program. Uh, that program provides, uh, like I said, subsidized rent. I think it's like, like $300 a month. Um, it provides <coughs> or covers all of the utilities, uh, housing, things like that, as well as uh, opportunities to kind of uh, volunteer and, and help out with, with others that are coming through that program. Uh, City of Mount Vernon was uh, great in linking us up with uh, some block grant funding to try to get a bunch of uh, lead paint removed. It was a, a very old house, so it had, unfortunately, some lead paint and uh, very thankful for uh, for getting that uh, renovation. This is what the house looked like before your guys' money came in. And if you wanna take a drive down that road and see how drastically different it looks now, um, we, we can't thank you enough for, for the, the funds that were, uh, were given to kind of bring that renovation uh, up to par. And just the, the difference that we've seen it make in the seniors that live in the house, the, the sense of pride that they take in that is, is noticeable. <laughs> Um, we also have uh, Oak House, which is a transitional housing program. It's also a sober living program. This is for folks that come out of either our men's or our women's house. We have six rooms that are available for that. It's also subsidized rent. Uh, I think it's, a, again, three fifty dollars a month for folks. And then they work closely with the caseworker to start working at saving money, uh, as well as uh, looking at, at uh, different steps that they need to take to be able to move into permanent housing of their own. Um, that one is uh, over in, in Burlington. We're having some conversations now about uh, maybe swapping the two of those because in retrospect we have our senior housing in a house that has steps and we have our workforce housing in a house that is single story. So likely those switches will happen um, within this next year. Um, but for now, um, all of our seniors are able to utilize the steps, but we just would like to make that change before it becomes an issue. Um, in addition to those programs, we do run a, a couple of uh, motel voucher programs. We do one uh, for families as well as just one that's cold weather. Uh, our family uh, voucher program, we have 12 families that are currently staying in motel leases with us. They can stay for up to six months uh, in our motel program. Uh, that's currently housing 41 people, over 12 families. Um, we just had uh, this last week, I need to brag on one of the ladies who just uh, got, uh, after being there for about five and a half months, got everything saved up and she secured an apartment right here in Mount Vernon for her and her kids and they <coughs> just moved out of the motel about a week ago and starting to get settled into their new place. So um, it doesn't always turn out that way, but when it does, like it's, it's worth celebrating and just want to brag on all the, all the hard work that she put in on her end to, to make that happen. Um, in addition to the family program, we do also run cold weather uh, motel programs, and that's just uh, looking at kind of when we have an overflow from the cold weather shelter program and other things like that. Um, we house about 21 folks uh, in, in those cold weather uh, motel programs as well. Um, the other thing that we're able to do for the family specifically is we do have monies available that we can help with rental assistance and things like that. So if they are taking the steps towards moving towards uh, housing, we can access some funds to help them with that first month, last month security deposit to make that a little bit of an easier step and transition back into permanent housing. Uh, aside from that, we also provide a meal service. Um, we are open 365 days a year for free meals. Uh, it's something that Tom, uh, the guy who runs that program, is very proud of that he's never missed a meal ever since it's been open. Um, we've had some close calls with power outages and fun things that, that made it so that we might have missed one, but we haven't. Um, so uh, we provide 365 days a year uh, food. Uh, our guests are able to come in and eat three meals a day, and then we open are open to the public, to anyone that needs a free meal for the evenings. 
Um, we serve about 5,000 hot meals every single month, um, and that's probably realistically on the conservative side of things. Um, in addition to that, we also, uh, in, in recognition that we only serve our guests during the day, we have a couple vans that go out to various points uh, throughout the city um, and do sandwiches for lunch for folks that, that may need it. Uh, no questions asked, show up, get a bag of lunch. Uh, we do about uh, 450 sack lunches a month uh, through that program as well. Um, and uh, it's a, a fantastic uh, program where we actually have like a lot of the guests that stay in our houses also work in the kitchen as a part of their giving back and, and just kind of helping others that are going through similar things to them. Um, in addition to providing that service, we also work uh, with uh, folks that are either coming out of issues with homelessness or have are coming from a, a low income background and trying to establish new skills. We run a program called Hunger to Hope where Tom works with uh, folks to give them kitchen skills. Tom used to own his own restaurant and he's very plugged into the, the food scene in the greater Skagit area. So he brings people in, teaches them everything from knife skills to how to prepare these different vegetables, uh, you know, uh, that, that they may not be as, as used to, to, to using on a regular basis, um, looking at health department codes, working with them to get food handler permits, things like that. And through that uh, apprenticeship program uh, works <coughs> with them sometimes coming from just a desire to work in the food industry to being hired on at a local restaurant and being able to, to move into housing with that. Um, uh, so oftentimes um, the folks that come through that program um, are, are in a pretty good place to be able to move into housing of their own where they have this new skill set where they can uh, get a slightly higher wage than what they would be able to if they didn't go through, through that program. Um, and then outside of the programs that we provide for, for our guests that come through, we also have a lot of services that we just provide for the community, anybody that needs them kind of no questions asked. And those are kind of some of the things that um, maybe we're not as well known for. And, and that's kind of shame on us for not talking about it more. Um, but uh, we do, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, have a van that goes around and delivers sandwiches. That's 11.30 to 12 every day. We're uh, right across from uh, Carpet One uh, next to uh, Mr. T's in Mount Vernon. Um, there's a van that's parked there seven days a week. Uh, anybody that you need to send for a sandwich or food, send them there, we're happy to feed them. Um, we also have a bus pass program. If folks are, are stranded, they need to get someplace, they need to get back to Burlington or Cedar Woolley or anything like that, they can swing by our office right in Mount Vernon. We're happy to get them a bus pass uh, that can get them wherever they need to go. Um, we also have a donation room that we open on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 10 to 3. It essentially functions as a totally free thrift store. No questions asked. Anybody can come get whatever they need. We have uh, clothing, uh, items for houses, items for children. Um, we also provide uh, shower access Monday through Friday, 1 to 3 um, for women, and then uh, Monday through Friday, uh, 9 to noon for men. Uh, you can send anybody over to our area in Mount Vernon. We'll get them a nice hot shower um, and, a, and a fresh change of clothes if they need that. Um, we also provide a free laundry service to the community as well, uh, and that is a Wednesday, through th or Wednesday and Thursday, uh, 1 through 4. Uh, anybody that just needs uh, fresh, clean clothes you can come by, we'll unlock it and sit with them. Uh, we usually have some volunteers that hang out and chat with them while they do some laundry um, and find out if they need plugged into to other services or if the laundry is really enough, then, you know, perfect, that's fine as well. Um, so that's kind of in a nutshell um, w what we do. And I just, you know, have been very impressed with the, the level of involvement in coming into Skagit County, uh, both here uh, in Mount Vernon and in Burlington and at the county level for uh, the, the work that you all are doing kind of to be proactive with the, the housing issues that we're facing in Western Washington. So just wanted to say uh, thanks. And if there's uh, any questions or anything I can clarify, I'm, I'm happy to try to do so. Great, thank you. Jo <clears throat> thank you, Jonathan, and welcome. Um, Council members, do you have any questions for? <coughs> <coughs> Sometimes you forget all the other things that you do, so thank you for reminding sure. us about laundry and things like that. Richard, go ahead. Um, well, thank you. Thank you for the presentation, and it seems like you're off to a great start, so welcome, and thanks for all your hard work. And I wanted to thank you, your board, and your staff, and all the volunteers. I know you have a lot of volunteers. <laughs> 
And if people have extra time and interest, uh, come see Mr. Klein. Um, I, my, uh, I'm kind of curious about the First Step Center, mm -hmm. and not Absolutely. about the history, but sure. about current and mm -hmm. how you're doing, and uh, 42, 45 um, shelters that you have, and how full are they, and how's that going? Yeah, so right now, um, in the winter months, uh, we, we are full. Um, so we're, we're full there, and we're pretty much full in the, the night drop-ins as well. Um, when things are a little warmer, um, uh, maybe it's, it's more typical for us to be around 30-ish. Um, we have recently made some changes that have uh, made it so that we're staying full longer. There was originally a policy that they did. Um, entire groups of folks would come in at one time. Um, we're, now we're looking at it more in real time where if somebody exits we try to fill it immediately rather than waiting for um, you know that next month on the 15th to admit people um, that that was a policy but we sat down and talked with the county about that and came to an agreement that it made more sense just to deal in real time it'd be a a little more more work on on the front end of it but that it could uh, be better utilized for for what it's intended to um, it is going really well. The one thing that we have found, um, and not not surprising to, to anyone that's started one of these projects, but I mean, it it does cost a lot more than we originally thought it was. When I look back at that that first budget that that Tina and and and, and Mayor Sexton and maybe some of you uh, looked at, um, it, it's drastically different now that we've done it for a couple years and we realize what we can do with volunteers versus what we need trained staff to do. Um, it is uh, more expensive than, than we had initially thought it would be. Um, we currently have a contract with the county that extends through the end of April, and then we're kind of looking at, at what, um, what that will look like going forward after the month of April. But as of right now, that's kind of where, where our contract is. Well, it's a very positive report. Thank you for that. And uh, thanks for all your work. Yeah, thank you. All right. Any other questions? All right, thank you so much, Jonathan, thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate your time. Appreciate thank you. it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, item B tonight. So um, our director, uh, Growth, has uh, had a family emergency as well. So I'm going to just read this myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, tonight, uh, this is about planning commission member confirmations. So I am asking for the approval of uh, the mayoral appointments of Mary May Hart and Adair <coughs> Orr to the Planning Commission for terms that are expiring on December 31st, oh, 2022. So it's re-upping uh, their terms. They both have been serving. Um, the mayor is seeking reappointment for these two commissioners to continue serving on the Mount Vernon Planning Commission for another four-year terms. In accordance with Mount Vernon Municipal Code Chapter 2.60, Members of the City Planning Commission shall be appointed by the Mayor and confirmed by the City Council. The terms of office for the members of the City Planning Commission shall be four years. This request complies with the establishment membership appointment requirements for the City's Planning Commission. And attached you'll find the current uh, Planning Commission roster uh, and you'll see that these are the two that um, we're looking to reappoint if the Council confirms them tonight. Any questions about this? I have no questions. I'll make a motion that council confirm the mayoral appointments. Thank you. Second. All right, motion by Melissa and a second by Gary. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed, same side. Motion carries, thank you. And Mr. Orr is here tonight, so if it's okay, we'll go ahead and make it official and swear him in. Hope you're planning on that, Adair. <laughs> <laughs> Adair, how many terms? <coughs> this is the third time up. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to have consistency. Yeah. All right. I'll have you read that. If you would um, repeat after me. I, and then state your oh, name. I, Adair Orr. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution and laws. And the Constitution and laws. Of the state of Washington. Of the state of Washington. And that I will faithfully and impartially. And that I will faithfully and impartially. Perform and discharge the duties. Perform and discharge the duties. Of Mount Vernon Planning Commission member. Of Mount Vernon Planning Commission member. For the city of Mount Vernon. 
for the city of Mount Vernon. County of Skagit. County of Skagit. State of Washington. State of Washington. According to law. According to law. To the best of my ability and understanding. To the best of my ability and, under and understanding. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> to item C tonight it's the agreement uh, approval of an agreement with the Johnston group and Peter Donovan is here for this item Peter thank you mayor hello again council yes it is agreement renewal season uh, first meeting in January so, uh, for the past year and a half the Johnston group has advocated for the city by working to secure federal funding and support for city projects such as the library commons project uh, the the two million dollar federal funding appropriation that the city received last year for the Commons project. That was a result of the efforts of, of the Johnston Group working in close collaboration with Mayor Boudreaux. Um, but they've also helped out with support for the Riverside Drive project, grant tracking, or the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, those have all been tasks that have been taken on by the Johnston Group uh, under its past and expiring contract with the city. So the new proposed contract before you tonight provides for the continuation of these effective advocacy and lobbying services to the city, uh, while the monthly maintainer, uh, excuse me, <laughs> retainer increases slightly, uh, the contract also includes a proportionate increase of, of time and services provided on the city's behalf. So the Johnson Group has secured a significant return on investment for the city, and in recognition of that strategic alignment, staff is recommending that council authorize the mayor to enter into this agreement with the Johnson Group for advocacy on the city's federal policy and funding agendas. Any questions for Peter on this? I think I did want to point out too that it um, it's not for like an entire year and I'm trying flipping really quick to try and figure it out. Um, we can part ways with I believe a 30 day notice. Yes. Uh, maybe my question would be we had talked about um, the idea of reapplying for the raise grant and mm -hmm. we're thinking about some uh, ap a grant application support is this uh, do you think this vehicle is this the vehicle or is there a different this is not the vehicle um, we've actually done a little more digging on getting some grant support and the recommended <coughs> from that grant agency was that to not do the raise grant again but to focus efforts on a winter off offering winter offering that sounds funny of the um, community charging program which should be coming out uh, probably by the end of February and focus efforts there so we're gonna go for some advice on that um, what we are asking Jake to do though is talk with our delegation about that because our delegation is always keen on promoting the raise and so we want to make sure that the delegation doesn't have some expectations that we, they want us to go for certain things too so I guess it's up in the air still a little bit Thank you. All right, well, I'll make a motion that council authorize the mayor to enter into an agreement with the Johnston Group for advocacy on the city's federal policy and funding agendas. I'll second the motion. All right, thank you. Uh, motion by Melissa and a second by Juan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries, thank you. Item D tonight is the approval of an agreement extension uh, with Cara Lorenzo, I think, and this is our public defense contract extension with Peter Donovan presenting. Thanks. Council, of course, the city continues to provide uh, indigent, indigent defense uh, services uh, for, for clients, and within this public defense program, the, the city maintains a roster of what we call conflict counselors or attorneys who can represent clients when those clients might have a conflict of interest with the city's primary public service, uh, public defense provider, which is M Mountain Law Firm. Uh, Kara Lorenzo has been providing outstanding public defense services for the city as a conflict counselor since 2021. Uh, tonight, staff is recommending that council authorize the mayor to renew Ms. Lorenzo's public defense contract with the city through 2023. Any questions for Peter on this? I make, I'll go ahead. <laughs> Are you going to make one? Uh, not a question. I was going to motion for approval. The, 
<laughs> Just go for it. <laughs> I'll, I'll motion for the approval with the proposed uh, one-year contract renewal with uh, Ms. Lorenzo. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, motion by Juan and a second by Gary. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. All right, now this is the one I thought I was introducing. Um, item E is the approval of agreement amendment. This is with uh, public defense with Mountain Law, and Peter Donovan will present. Peter. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. So when there is no conflict between a client and the city's primary public defense provider, uh, Mountain Law has been consistently providing quality uh, public defense services for the city of Mount Vernon since 2014. Along the way, the city has sought proposals from other public defense agencies and has found Mountain Law to stand out among its peers in its ability to provide services that, that exceed the stringent standards that cities must maintain for their public defense programs. Uh, Mountain Law's contract, the current contract with the city, uh, is expiring and with the guidance of outside counsel, uh, this is an opportune time to, to once again assess Mountain Law's performance and efficiency in meeting those public defense standards. That's something we, we always want to do along the way. Uh, tonight, this proposed addendum to the original Mountain Law contract allows for continued public defense services at the existing rate for a period of three months. And during this time, the city will work with outside counsel to conduct a review uh, of Mountain Law's public defense services and consider whether or not we may need to go out and request qualifications from, from other providers. This review can be completed and a new contract brought back to council in April. If council uh, is willing to approve staff's recommendation tonight to authorize the mayor to extend the city's existing contract with Mountain Law for an additional three month period. All right, questions for Peter on this? I'd make a motion to uh, Authorize the mayor to enter, uh, enter agreement with uh, Mountain Law for an additional three month period. Thank you. Second the motion. Thank you. A motion by Gary and a second by Juan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Item F tonight is approval of agreement. This is with Volunteers of America. Peter. Thank you, Mayor. And this agreement is for the city's CDBG program. The agreement really memorializes a portion of the city's 2022 to 23 CDBG annual action plan that, that council has already approved, but, but because this agreement includes an amount that's greater than the current $10,000 threshold, uh, it's being brought back before council again tonight uh, as an agenda item on its own. Volunteers of America Western Washington plans to utilize these federal funds to provide mediation services to Mount Vernon's residents within the juvenile court system. The total amount, the total amount of the contract is $17,999, and that represents exactly 5% of the city's total annual CDBG allocation from HUD. Uh, tonight's staff is recommending that council authorize the mayor to enter into the CDBG funded agreement with Volunteers of America for Community Services. All right, questions for Peter. Go ahead, Richard. My, my question just around the, the term of the agreement, um, Mr. Donovan, the, there's several, there's some dates that are sort of conflicting, so maybe if you could just clarify the term of the agreement. Is it for the next year, 2023? Yeah, it um, is, yeah, for the next year or until they can spend their $18,000, okay. yeah, whichever comes first. And, and really, they could, they could potentially carry this over into future years and um, that's all managed through HUD's IDIS system. Okay. There's there's a couple of places in the the draft that's in front of us, like on time of performance section three where it talks about um, July one twenty two through June thirty twenty three. So I don't I don't know if it just needs a read through or how that happened, but um, you've answered my question, so thank you. Yep, you bet. Thank you. Is that the plan year? That's the plan year. Yeah. yeah. I thought it gets confusing. Yep. So Questions? I'd be happy to make a motion to authorize the mayor to enter into an agreement with um, better, what was it? VOA. Second. Thank right. you. Thank you. <laughs> motion v. Mo motion uh, by Richard and a second by Iris. I heard that right. Okay. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Item G tonight is an approval of agreement with Jen Pittler, 
Jen Pinder Consulting, LLC. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you, Mayor. We are, we're getting there, Council. Uh, in, in assessing <laughs> the need to bridge the approximate $6 million funding gap the city is currently facing for the Library Commons uh, project, staff brainstormed some ways to conduct a capital fundraising campaign and then sought outside guidance on the subject and in working with the Skagit Community Foundation, staff identified a, a strategic plan forward. So use, utilizing available funding from an unfilled library associate position that council approved in the city's 2022 budget for the purpose of supporting the Library Commons fundraising effort. Uh, staff was advised that uh, hiring a certified fundraising executive to oversee the capital campaign would likely be a more efficient uh, use of, of this funding. Staff then received a project proposal from Jen Pittner Consulting LLC and believes that contracting with this service provider through a temporary professional services agreement through the end of 2023 will allow the city and the library foundation to make a solid push toward the funding finish line for the Commons project. Again, the city would utilize its budgeted amount from the unfilled library position to fund the greater portion of this service, and the library foundation would contribute any expenses above that budgeted amount. I'm talking about Jennifer Pittner like she's not here. <laughs> Hello, Jennifer, welcome. Uh, Jen has played an instrumental role in, in the success of the Skagit YMCA capital campaign recently. Her, her strong reputation and connection within our community make her, uh, we think, the ideal uh, candidate for uh, the director of this cap capital campaign role. And because of that, staff is recommending the council authorize the mayor to enter into this professional services agreement with Jen Pittner LLC for the execution and oversight of a capital fundraising campaign. All right, questions for Peter on this particular item? I have no questions. Uh, I'll make a motion that council authorize the mayor to enter into a professional services agreement with Jen Pittner Consulting, LLC. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Uh, motion by Melissa and a second by Juan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Item H tonight is approval of an agreement with Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance and now we're switching it up. Jennifer Berner gets to come up, <laughs> our Parks and Enrichment Services Director. <coughs> Jennifer. Good evening, Council and Mayor. Um, so this agreement that is before you it gives Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance um, the permission to do trail maintenance on our trails here. They um, do this with a lot of different cities. Um, and so this gives them permission to come in and do trail maintenance. The focus is going to be at Little Mountain. It's not establishing new trails, it's doing maintenance on current trails. Um, as in past practice, we will continue what the, the relationship we've had with them in the past. If they're gonna come in and do maintenance, they, we work with them on a scope of work. We go out and visit them on site. We all agree on what that maintenance of work will look like, and then we move forward and they go do the work, and then we check in with them throughout the course of the project. So we're just asking for staff to, is recommending approval of a mayor to enter into a landowner agreement with Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance for, um, for maintenance of our mountain bike trails at Little Mountain. All right, questions for Jennifer then. Richard, go ahead. Uh, my question is the just is, how is this uh, coordinated with some of the other um, groups maintaining trails? That's your that's a function you do. Is uh, there are other groups maintaining our trails? Correct. Most of the groups that so we have WTA that does um, some work for us, um, and we'll be coming forward with another agreement for them for 2023. We're working on that right now, um, and so they focus mostly on hiking trails. Um, not on mountain biking trails. Okay. Um, and then we also work with the um, Parks Foundation and their group, and they do trail ma maintenance out there as well. So all that gets coordinated through our office. We meet with each and every one of those groups. We meet them on site. We work with them on a scope of work. Um, and so nobody's out there kind of going rogue. Um, they're all working through us so that we can manage those different projects. And then our staff does some maintenance out there on our trails as we have time or depending on the type of project. If it's tree removal and large things like that, then our staff are out there managing those types of projects. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just curious um, if the 
so uh, for the public, there's actually a there's a trail building effort with uh, is it Parks Foundation on the that's 21st? the trail builders, and so they do maintenance the out there as okay. well, and then. Um, we do our own volunteer projects mm -hmm. as well in a variety of parks um, through okay. the city that we put out. Right. If folks are interested, come out on the 21st, but I often get asked questions about how that coordination happens, so maybe I'll have to follow up with you a little bit later too um, about that. Sure. Okay. Certainly. Thank you. Uh-huh. All right. Any other questions for Jennifer? All right. I'd entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to enter into a, a landowner agreement with Evergreen Mountain Bike Alliance. I'll second the motion. Thank you. Motion by Garen, a second by Juan. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. All right. Item I is our winter road maintenance <coughs> briefing, and our public works director, Chris Phillips, is, Chris Phillips is here <laughs> hey, boss. for this particular item. Thank you, Mayor. This is just an information brief for, uh, for Council. Um, Jason, if you want to come on up, you can have a good seat here behind me. Uh, <laughs> just want to share with you, if you did not know, we did have a, uh, a snow event, uh, <laughs> two of them, back to back, followed by an ice event, followed our freezing rain ice event, followed by localized flooding. So it was a little bit of everything right before Christmas, and uh, again, we were the recipient of, of just some interesting weather facts. So I'll just go through the first six or seven slides, informational, and then as Councilmember Morales uh, mentioned, we did do a, in uh, Navy terms, it was a hot wash. So after every single brief or every single flight or something that you would do, you'd sit down and debrief it. And we did a comprehensive debrief. I've got about five slides to uh, brief you on that and then entertain any questions that you might have. So uh, we've got some actual pictures here from, uh, if you go to the lower left, uh, that is Jason and the crews prior to any events going on, much like we did with flood prep. They do a snow prep as well with our, our plows, <coughs> making sure everything is operational and ready to go. So when we do get the call that we do have winter weather on board, they can act on it. And then we've got two action photos up there from our traffic cameras. You can see a, a pair in formation up there on the left-hand side, I believe going at a brisk 15 miles an hour uh, in there as they're, they're working uh, the streets. And then another one with uh, snow cover, but you can see plow operations going there. Uh, next, just to give you an idea of inventory of our, our equipment, uh, we've got uh, three plows that you have there. Uh, you can see uh, numbers uh, 269, 250, 245. Again, they have uh, spreaders that are on the back of that that could disperse sand or salt uh, as well. So just to kind of give you an idea there. We also have some, uh, a two wheel uh, plow sander, uh, that's 219 and then 220 is a four wheel drive plow and sander. Um, that one was the one that was broken, I think during the time that it only had a two wheel drive capability. So again, when you're looking at a, a rather steep hills that we have, two wheel drive, not necessarily the vehicle of choice uh, to go out there. And then last <laughs> is just the sand salt uh, shed that we have uh, out there on the Public Works campus behind Mr. T's. Next is just the, this is up on our website. Uh, I know you're familiar with this, but uh, uh, hitting the Public Works tab, hitting streets, snow plow, uh, I'm sorry, snow routes. Uh, here is our primary routes that you have here in red. Um, if you notice, this is basically for essential services. Uh, it does uh, take care of the major hill structures that are here in the city uh, and service up to the hospital. You get into um, priority two streets, they're there in gold or yellow. Uh, again, that is the, again, a good significant number of arterial streets that we have here in Mount Vernon. And then you follow that up with all the blue, which is basically the local and, and residential uh, streets that we have. Okay. So now comes the assessment. So what we took a look at was on our equipment. Uh, we had some information that was coming in from the public that uh, <coughs> folks who live in different areas uh, around our country that get a lot more snow than, than Mount Vernon does on why don't you have this, why don't you have that as, as far as different types of. So you can see the three plows that we have. We use a, a rubber plow bit versus a steel plow bit. 
Uh, the reason the rubber plow bit is, you know, we have less street surface damage. So if you think about anything that we're out there working on during the springtime and during the summer, we don't want to rip it up with a, a steel plow, again, because the frequency of our snowstorms, not so much. But when they do happen, they usually pack a, a fairly uh, good punch, and then you add in the hills and things of that nature. It, it's a recipe for an interesting time. Um, by using the rubber plow uh, bits, uh, saves utility covers, a uh, variety of different things that you have around the, the, on the streets less noise, again, when we're out there plowing. Uh, they're more pliable, meaning they're more flexible, uh, and they're affordable, okay? Uh, some of the cons that go along with that, so Council Member Morales, we don't only just look at the good, there are some bad that go along with it. Uh, it does leave a thin uh, film of snow <coughs> or ice that will remain after this type of plow or bit goes through, and it doesn't work very well on compact snow. So if you think about our efforts being primary one or priority ones, priority twos, by the time we get to priority threes, there may be a lot of time that our residents have already gone out. Our plows still will go through the streets. However, our plows may not be as effective as, as one would like because the snow has already been compacted down. Okay, so that's one aspect. The environment. Here's something just having flown through this area over 20 <laughs> years of my naval career is 27, 27 different microclimates within our Puget Sound region. What does that mean to us? You know, it has to be the warm, moist air coming up from the southwest and a Fraser Valley cold front coming through with the winds to really set something up for us. And when it happens, uh, it really does set us up for a significant snowfall when you look at, again, our hilly terrain that we have here. Jason and his crews have over 20, 274 lane miles of road to take care of, of the primary or priority one, twos, and threes. Here's another fact, salt application. Everybody's like, I want more salt, give me salt. But in this particular situation, the days it was too cold. So our salt is not gonna be active under 28 degrees Fahrenheit. So through the days you may see that, hey, we put salt down at night, things could refreeze, and now you're dealing with black ice. So it's not that we don't salt, it's Jason and his crews salting in the appropriate areas that may have more volume going over there, like those priority one routes that our police and uh, fire department use to get to the hospital, that those make the most sense that we're going out there and working on. Uh, similarly, when you look at sand application, Okay, the sand application, this becomes, again, an environmental issue here because once that sand goes on the road, it now becomes a sweeper issue or it's going into our stormwater system, which means we got to clean out all of our catch basins. We have to bag this because it's now contaminated and we have to be able to dispose of it over at the Skagit transfer station. So when you think of, <coughs> you know, I keep on thinking of... Uh, the Saturday Night Live with more cowbell. You know, we need more <laughs> sand in these areas. It's, it's not necessarily maybe the best choice for all areas. The other thing to think about with some of the narrower streets, so when we were getting a lot of the calls for service in the residential areas, the spreader is gonna spread sand 14 feet, so seven feet of center line. And if it's going down a road and you happen to be that individual that has six cars for your house and three of them are out on the street, you could be getting pelted by sand as well, which is another you know, factor that, that Jason and his crews take into account before applying that. So there are a, a variety of things that we take a look at. The other thing with the salt, or I'm sorry, with the sand, when you put it out there, it refreezes easily, and now you get even a more of a clumpy mess that's out there that you think is providing more traffic or traction, but it actually doesn't. So again, something to factor in when you're just looking at the event is the wind chills and the other the other factors that come into play with this. Okay. Whoops. There we go. So for responses, this is one where uh, our E three one one system. So on day one was a snow event. That's why I left it in white. We had four agency calls. That could have been from Skagit Transit uh, nine one one, our two chiefs, uh, their their departments. So we had four calls for service there that were on priority one streets that we worked on. The residential that you had there, those four, all four were in priority three areas. So again, if you think about the first 
15 to 20 hours of an event, we're hitting priority one, two. We may not even get to a priority three street just due to the fact that we only have three plows that are working this continuous event. And again, the focus being on those areas where the hospital district is and, and the priority one and two streets just to make sure people can get around. Yes. Dr. Phillips, could you clarify? I wasn't tracking. What's agency? What's residential? So agency, think of Skagit uh, Transit, 911, or our first responders call okay. us. So that's where I was going with an agency versus a residential call. They called? They call called Public Works. Uh -huh. And then E311 is a system that we utilize that's basically like a work order. And that work order then would be sent out to our crews, and then they would sit there and act on it if, okay. if they were able to. First day, four, four agencies called you for service and four residences. Correct. Okay, thank you. On day one. Day two, two and ten, two agency calls, ten residential calls. And this was in that transitional period, okay, that, that now our crews are able to get through. Most of our priority ones are, are being worked on. Our priority twos now are being worked on. And now they're going into uh, the priority three work on, on day two. So they were hitting a lot of these particular areas to the best of their ability, okay, in, the, in that regard. And again, you got to think about steep slopes. You got to think about the smaller streets and to be able to fit a plow going through there. So again, we met most of those calls that were in there. Day three was the surprise. This is where the mayor declared an emergency on this. I got a separate slide on this, but we had a freezing rain call, and then we also had uh, all of our residential calls were, were at Pry three locations when we were dealing with this ice storm that was coming in to work. So on day three, mayor declared an emergency. Basically, essential staff only uh, was here in the city. Uh, from what we got from the police department was that there was a significant reduction in vehicular traffic. And that's what the King 5, Como 4, thir you know, Fox 13 were putting out, that if you didn't need to be out, don't be out. And that's what we saw on our streets. But with this case, you got Jason and the crews, really the focus is on that hospital district, that critical area, so that our police and fire can get to the hospital or for people who are in need of that can, can get there by using those 911 services. Um, again, uh, after the temperature moderated, this was probably at about like noonish, two o'clock-ish that day, temperatures ramped up very nicely. Uh, ice necessarily was not the issue. Uh, now we got into a flooding situation. So Jason and the crews now are transitioning from hitting some of those pry three streets to make sure that they were cleared and were accessible and to move but now we've got a snow and ice melt going on and they've got to make sure that all the catch basins have a way to get storm water into those as well as all your drains so that it's not backing up and now we have a flooding issue, that's where we transfer it into that type of um, emergency action response, okay? And then the last, uh, or I think I got one more slide after this, um, was on the public assistance side. What could we do uh, as far as helping, uh, or the public helping us, would be parking vehicles in garages or driveways. Uh, in other words, get the vehicles off the streets so that we've got a, a nice clear canvas to work on. Um, Jason and his crews took me on day two of the event. For, I had a three hour chance to get out there with them and look at the whole entire city and where all the high, um, uh, traffic areas are as well as all the steep slopes and we were in a four-wheel drive truck and we're having difficulty as we're watching like the two-door Yugo going down the same hill I'm like wow there are some people who are really out there taking it you know taking it on board but uh, we got a chance to see and there's a lot of areas in our especially in our older districts where we've got a plow that can go one way in uh, it can deposit uh, the, the snow that's being plowed and then they've got to do a uh, probably an eight point turn just to turn around and try to navigate back up the hill again. But you've got that that snowpack that's uh, that's there. So again, we had other folks that were asking, you know, why did you leave it here or why did you leave it there? These folks will go out prior to a snow event on and basically look at the areas <coughs> where they are and okay, hey, we can deposit this over here. Hey, when we come down here, it's going to go on this this left side as we're doing it. So everything is choreographed before before we actually do the response. Um, another thing is um, some of those service calls that were in the Pride 3 areas and the residential areas, 
I'm unsure if people have chains, but this is again what was being put out on the news. This is something we can emphasize, I think, by putting things out in our bill. So I have a lessons learned slide after this, but you know, chain up for the conditions. There's not a whole ton that we're gonna be able to do for ice. I mean, if it's icy, as the mayor declared an emergency and kept all the non-essentials at home, that's probably, that is the best way to do, to do business until it, it passes while Jason and his crews are out there. Because again, the last thing you wanna see is a, a 10 ton plow on ice without the ability to stop. That's a, it's, it's not necessarily a, a good feeling in there. And in the four wheel drive that I was with them on, we had a few of those. I was like, oh, I hope we, ha hope we stop soon. Um, so just to let you know that. Uh, the other is dealing with uh, the narrow streets and then the responsibility of our, 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 our community is again, you know, the, the driveways and their sidewalks. I had the same issue where I live is I'll, pl I'll get rid of my snow in my driveway uh, I put it in my property, but when you get down close to the road, I'm putting it in the road. Well, when a plow comes by, you're going to have that chunk of snow that's, that's there in front of you, and it's, it's kind of that shared responsibility to get that and put that on your property so that you can entry and egress out your cars because we're not going to be able to take care of all 40,000 uh, folks you know, for each and every single driveway, but we, we do our best to, to mitigate that. Um, the sign that you see there is one that we're um, looking to put in areas that really are a, a, a steep slope um, that they cannot get their vehicles into or have very, you know, it's very narrow, it's very difficult is, you know, just the warning sign during snow events, four wheel drive or chains are recommended, you know, just to bring up that awareness. And then the last slide is probably the most important out of all of it is we know we, we have lessons to learn. Just because Jason and his crews have been doing this for years doesn't mean that we can't learn something. In this particular case, um, snow and ice removal press release, uh, working with Peter is getting that out early so that folks have an opportunity to prepare for that, at least remind them of that. Uh, in November through to, uh, February is to distribute a frequently asked question pamphlet with the monthly utility bills. Again, that educational piece we think is extremely important there. Um, we want to update the Public Works um, streets and snow and ice webpage so that frequently asked, again, we like to push information or you can go to our website and you can pull it, but we want to make sure that we're doing that. Um, we're cross-training uh, parks crews that are CDL qualified staff. We're going to be working through that. Jason had a great idea this morning, didn't upset, update the slide here, was that we also have prior streets members that are either in solid waste or wastewater. Uh, Jason was reaching them out to, out to them today as well to see if we can build that group. So instead of Jason and the crews working 20 or 30 hours, you know, straight in here, we can go and start working some shift work. So I thought that was another uh, a good lesson learned there. Just from a perspective, how long does it take just for one full loop of Pry One that take you up Kincaid to the hospital district and then Blackburn Road? Again, depending on the conditions, but for this particular snowstorm two and a half hours for just one pass, okay? So if you think about it, if the snow's coming down at a X rate, it could be three or four passes that one truck is taking just on that route alone, and we only have three trucks. So again, that dispersion of our assets with our crews to go do things, those priority ones are really the, the main event, and then we hit the pride twos and the pride threes as we can. Good news, thank you, Council. Uh, you appropriated funding for one additional plow for 2023. So working with Gary with getting that ordered because the lead time on that is hopefully we'll have it before next year. Uh, doesn't mean that we'll get rid of any of the other plows that we have here, but as we're building our bench up, you can see we're building our capacity. So that's the idea to be able to provide better service for our residents. And then we talked about um, the, the storage, we need to do a better job, I think, when it comes to taking a look at whether it's the Farmer's Almanac or whatever the, the weather guessers du jour are of, hey, what is it gonna look like this season? Well, this season was supposed to be a, a La Nina, which means wetter, not necessarily snowier. Um, so what's happening in Northern um, California now, thank, well, hearts and prayers go to them, but I'm kind of happy that it's there and not here because we had our opportunity in November of last year to deal with that type of significant rain event and, and what that did to us. So there is an opportunity for us to take a look and see, you know, maybe there's an opportunity to go buy and purchase more and we you know, we'll change that sand salt 
um, you know, instead of maybe being 50-50, that it's maybe 70-30 type of a spread and, and get that ordered earlier in the season. And with that, pending any questions for Jason and I, we'll stand by to hear anything you have to say. I'll see if there's any questions on this, and then <clears throat> you had prepared some information about waste management and some questions about oh, that. I so, sure did. But if, before we do that, is there questions about this topic? <coughs> or, go ahead. Yeah, well, first let me just say thank you uh, for the time, for putting this together, for what was the term that you used? That I you, used hot wash. Hot wash. So just a, just a for fancy hot word for a, for a debrief. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the hot wash. It, it's very informative. I think it helps out a lot. And you know, for the folks that, were, that are listening in, um, it, it provides uh, insight as to what the crews uh, go through um, during an event like this. Um, many great points that you brought up. I think ultimately one of the things that I was really thinking about is how can council uh, support the crews, uh, support the department, because um, if, if this department is supported, every other department will be as well, right? Mm -hmm. I, imagine this department <coughs> not having the full support, that would put the fire department uh, police in a situation where potentially they can't have access to certain areas, right? So sure. extremely vital um, to, to have you well supported through and through. Uh, so thank you for that. And I have to do, I have to also give a shout out to the mayor, because the mayor uh, authorizes, oh yes, absolutely, <laughs> about electronic snowblowers. So our, oh. our core uh, facilities crew usually are going out with shovels. I was out there, Doug was out there, you know, do what we do, and the mayor's like, I've got this neighbor, and she is, I won't say her age, mayor. Over 70, uh, over 70. Over 70, that had this electric, and was blowing out all her neighbor's uh, driveways for them. She's like, why don't we get that? They're sitting in my office yeah. and they're ready to go out. So. Very happy to, to have that for the police station, public works, the library. I know Jennifer's working on some parks areas too. So we're all talking with each other. And during the event, I shouldn't have left out Jennifer because her crews were very <coughs> instrumental on assisting us because we ended up having one facilities person out with COVID. The other one couldn't get into work. And we were leaning on Jennifer to help out at City Hall with getting some folks to shovel around there and, and our library, although it was closed, just preparing for when it was <coughs> open. So. Um, thank you, too. One question. Sure. Um, so currently there's three plows right now that can be operational during an event like this, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Uh, and then, if I understand correctly, going from a priority one uh, to the priority three areas, how long is that taking? Because I, I, I imagine a significant amount of time. Yeah, it depends on, on the amount of snowfall, right? So if it's still snowing, mm -hmm. like, you know, if it snows for three days, we're on priority one for three days before we even move in. Go to the other areas because we have to stay on top of those priority areas. Got it. And so if it takes you two and a half hours to complete a priority one and it gets recovered, yeah. you refocus you again back again. to the priority yeah. one. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So again, it just becomes a, an equation of how much personnel, well, we have a limit, three plows, mm -hmm. and then what Mother Nature is doing to us. So Again, the other thing to keep focus on, if you look at how many calls for service about this, okay, I know we have a town of about 38,000? 36. 36,000. We only had 30 calls. Now, that doesn't mean that we admit, you know, dis disregard the 30 people, but 30 calls for service, we, we did the best that we could do in those areas. And when we went out um, and did the, um, after the hot wash, went back out to the areas with Jason and kind of looked at them. What, what were things that we could have done, you know, differently in, in here? Some of those, like I said, are those steep sloped, very narrow street type pieces that, you know, even Andy and his crews um, who did the best they could, you know, other, other again, <laughs> other uh, cities or municipalities don't even do uh, garbage pickup, you know, and he was out there doing it, but there are certain areas even they don't go into because if they're stuck, they, these guys aren't gonna be able to get them out, you know? Tow truck's not going to go out there. I mean, they're literally stuck. So just some things to think about. Um, so the, the, I was thinking the first few hours are probably pretty essential. But it's interesting, though, you said, well, we, we, if it keeps snowing, we're just, it's like the first few hours all the time. And so you, it's, that's interesting. So I, ground, I ground really day. wrap my head around that. <laughs> but it does come back to capacity. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have more, it, it's that central first <coughs> part that's so essential to stay ahead of it. So you have to have the, the, the equipment and the people. And so you're working on both of those. And part, I guess the only question I have to add value is you, you said we had three working
plows plus a new one we're purchasing, but there's two unworking plows, and why aren't they working? Oh, in our, well, the four, it's a four-wheel, well, one's a two-wheel drive truck, which is not necessarily yeah. going to do anything good. Oh, don't want to steal your thunder. You go for right. it. Right. So we have the two smaller one-ton trucks. So yeah. those we use on the narrower streets, so in the neighborhoods, right? Uh, one truck is two-wheel drive, and one truck is four-wheel drive. But the four-wheel drive went out on the truck, right? And we couldn't get parts. So we went through the whole store with two two-wheel drive trucks instead of a four-wheel drive truck. Okay. So. But we'll get as far ahead of that as possible each Absolutely. year. And yeah, so yeah. that's, that's again, you know, and it'll be a very measured response. As you recall, my time in development services, we're evaluating the personnel who is still, still down on. We're still recruiting heavily for that and then the equipment. So 2024 will be another request for plow. Um, and again, it's just a balance of what we have uh, coming on to uh, to meet the response that our, yeah. our residents want. Yeah. Hopefully my second question is a little quicker. The you I saw somewhere back in there and I didn't digest it something about number of accidents. You're probably looking working with the police department. Where are the accidents? How do they overlap with our maps? How do we adjust our maps? Sure. So that's all being done. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure thing. Okay, and Mary, you asked okay. to transition into... Yeah, before we talk about just the questions, I know there's some uh, community members that talk about waste management. Um, just a minute to thank uh, Jason and his crew. Oh. What we didn't mention is Jason's down four positions in... Four. Four right. positions yeah, in... Three, right. Three. They're down three positions in street department, but I think half of the solid waste crew was out with the flu at the, <laughs> all at the same time, and so the work that was done was truly incredible, and yeah, so we want to thank Jason. Totally. It six out. So, yeah. it. I think the city did an outstanding job uh, for what was given to us, and the thank goodness we're not Buffalo. And so, <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Jason, for that. Okay. Um, some questions about waste management, and one thing before that, when we declared an emergency around the ice storm, um, you know, there is just no way I think in leadership that we would want to risk six hundred thousand dollar vehicles, um, city property, to go out and and service garbage, um, risking them sliding into other people's vehicles or their houses. I don't think anyone wants a viral TikTok video like Queen Anne in Seattle. <laughs> so, um, you know, 100% stand by the decision as far as our services to, you know, stand down and just <coughs> wait till it was safe for our <coughs> employees. So I'll just say that first, and then I'll have Chris um, just answer some questions about the waste management contract, which is a private service mm -hmm. to the citizens of Mount Vernon. Um, but Chris can give some information on, on what their response is. We have no control over their response, um, but I'll turn it over to Chris. So. Thanks, thanks, Mayor. So um, what I'd like to start off with is on the solid waste side. So one of the things that happens when Andy's out there and they're doing their work on the 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, if there was some area that they could not get, he is like over communicating to the utmost. One, press release over here to Mr. Donovan. Two, our website is being updated. Our Mount Vernon utilities folks that work for Doug are all given all of this information in case there's calls coming in for service, letting them know that the next business day that we can get out there, we're going to get it done. Um, I, I don't recall any E311 calls dealing with solid waste um, as not meeting the community's needs. I think they were fully understanding in that regard um, with, with what we were doing and updating that website as we were going on. Um, the big question came into waste management and dealing with the recyclables. Um, our contract, again, um, one, I'd just like to say, I, I did hand out a, just a, a handout to you before the council meeting, was it completely understand the residents' frustration that no recycling services was, were conducted from December 9th to January 4th. Um, but these were really a, a unique um, circumstances um, and waste management did follow the, the contract to the best of their um, ability. Um, in number two that I provided here was just the chapter and verse from it where um, waste management, what are their responsibilities within inclement weather? Um, biggest things here are um, that they will notify the city, uh, which they did, uh, letting us know each day that they weren't going to be able to have service and then what that service would be. Um, but also the customers were able to get information via either their automated telephone, a text, or an email. Um, and I talked to a variety of staff that live in the city of Mount Vernon that indeed waste management was conveying that 
that information that you know you could hold your recyclables I'll, I'll call it on station Navy term at your house in your garage what have you and then you could put out as much that you that you needed to on the next pickup day understanding that with the holidays and everything that was a significant amount of time so under understand that part of it um, the last part of it was that I shared with you uh, was uh, the waste management's point of contact. So when we get any uh, call for service uh, in regard to this, so most of those calls will go to um, Doug staff over on the Mount Vernon utility side. Some will go to Andy and David and the staff over in solid waste. And when we get those, we package those calls up and email the person <coughs> that's the regional person here yeah, for waste management and their representation. So they're aware that these customers are having an issue and what is that solution per our contract and to convey that information back to them. And from what I can gather in that email environment, those conversations were going on and we were being told from the city that they, that they waste management, were made, had made contact. And again, I was talking to Council Member uh, Molinar before the, the meeting here where the waste management truck happened to take his recycle bin uh, with them <laughs> in the truck uh, and the difficulty he had getting it back, um, not trying to make light of a situation there, Council Member Molinar, but I mean it is. And then, you know, how do you sit there and rectify that particular um, situation? So um, again, if, they are, if, if the community is sharing information with us, we immediately share the information with them and and then validate that they are verify that they did contact the individuals and let them know what the situation was. So pending that, open to any of your your questions or comments. Sure. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, well, what uh, it, would revisiting the contract with waste management uh, be an option? Because I mean, it sounds a little bit uh, unfair for the city and for the city's residents to. Uh, essentially be out almost four weeks without service right the the first two weeks of piling up the recyclables with the additional two weeks on top of that uh, until they can make their next round because they missed the last one due to weather of course but I mean it's not like waste management will reduce um, the payment to the residents I mean they're still gonna charge the same I assume uh, but in a, situ in a situ situation like that doesn't it make sense to potentially re revisit that contract and see how it can be of any help uh, or of any benefit to the residents in a situation like that. Councilman Morales, great question. Um, I'm going to phone a friend. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk to uh, our legal, our city attorney, Kevin well, Rogers. To renegotiate terms, certainly they can do so. One of the issues with us was that there was only one provider mm -hmm. for recycling and that's waste management. Otherwise the city's option was to do it in house. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at two sides of a transaction, you got to look at the interests of both parties and whether or not there is a financial interest on waste management to alter terms that would be less uh, of a financial incentive for them because they are there for uh, profit. Um, and that was a thing we frankly faced in negotiating the contract and the terms that we got. Uh, we did the best we could, uh, but there were some terms such as escalation clauses that they were not willing to budge. And it was basically find another provider. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, that's how the negotiations went at that point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well. I'll add one thing too. We could ask to renegotiate. They could also say no, which they probably would. <laughs> However, I see where we're, we're going on that, yeah. right? I think our, the consolation there is what we have done, and I believe that's what waste management does too, is you're going to have a lot to put out, and they're saying they'll pick it all up, right? So hopefully that's some service, uh, as inconvenient as it could be to our, our residents. Um, mm -hmm. We would love to see them come the next week or something, right? Um, but at least they're allowed to put out more um, than what the can is, is what I understand. We didn't do that. We mm -hmm. kept it. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, to put out the excess without yes, an additional charge, so that could be that might have been not have been really clear to everybody. So that's something that we could potentially do, because um, like honestly, it wasn't clear to my husband and I. We didn't put out any extra; we just kind of saved it. We were going to kind of cycle it through in the mm -hmm. next month or whatever. Um, but maybe that's the one thing we could do communication-wise is ensure 
that waste management would pick up extra if it's put out the next collection day. And that could help. From what I could tell from the their website, that is what they did, and I will defer to Mr. Donovan. It, yes, that's who I was working with on that one. So, yeah. yeah. But I think again the the situation of that storm over the holidays. If it would have been just the storm, and you take the holidays out of it, I don't think it would have been as bad. But I I, I completely understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Now, four weeks is a four weeks. long time. <laughs> Yes. When I heard six weeks from some people um, that, that it wasn't just limited to the four, I think what they've got going against them is that our city did a fantastic job and it didn't make them look very good for doing a poor job. Um, but I, I wonder if we should have a communication from them, you know, from the council, you know, about what we heard in a summary uh, about it. And maybe there's a couple of asks in there or maybe there's one. Um, but. I, I don't know, I've certainly got enough emails that, um, you know, it seems like we ought to at least uh, share share that message uh, with them. I, not saying, we, I don't know if there's, there's no other options except to communicate about expectations. Yeah, if we're complying with the contract, then uh, and I haven't looked at it particularly for these issues. Uh, but that's your enforcement, like, uh, like a franchise agreement with a, a cable provider, here's what terms and conditions to use our rights of way. This is basically a, a franchise for a city for recycling, for residential, and here's the terms and conditions. Those are what they're bound to comply with. Um, so if they are strictly complying with those terms, you do not have a remedy in contract. But you certainly can uh, make your point heard. Uh, you can always seek to renegotiate um, and uh, proceed. Would the council like us? We'd happy to compile comments if you'd like us to to send to waste management. Well, I suspect there's no harm in asking, is there? Or there's never harm in asking. Okay. Mm -hmm. What would you like to ask? Or compile comments? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> so the, those council members, if you don't mind, um, send me bullet points of what you because I didn't see any emails. I could ask our staff to yeah. look at some if we had any. Did we have any emails, Peter? We had We'd, we had e three one one, but oh three one one didn't. We didn't okay. have anything from Andy. We're happy to compile what we received. But, sure. but if you have emails that came directly to you that we wouldn't know about, if you could just compile mm -hmm. those for us in a bullet points or something and send them along, that would just make it easier for us. So send a few. All right, thank, thank you. you. Okay. Okay, great. All right, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jason. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jason. All right. We've completed our scheduled agenda items. We do have item J, which is an executive session on the agenda now. And I will ask our city <coughs> attorney to read the reason why we will have an executive session. Uh, we're going to have an executive session to discuss with legal counsel matters regarding city enforcement action, litigation, or potential litigation to which the city of the governing body or a member acting in an official capacity is likely to become a party when public knowledge regarding such discussion is likely to result in either adverse legal or financial consequence to the city pursuant to RCW 4230 110 subsection 1i. We would close the executive session at uh, 849. No final action after. All right, Thank great. You, that will be excused into executive session until 849. <coughs>